The Free Seas Champagne Cocaine Cards, Six Digit Bonuses, Fast Cars and Healthy Ambition, The True Life of a Trader is unveiled with a lot of humor in City Boy. I asked the author how close the life of Steve was to his previous life as a top-ranked research analyst. It's about 80% or more, and, and the other stories that are in it that aren't necessarily things that happened to me, they are stories I heard from my colleagues or, or my, you know, my, my, my clients. So pretty much everything in this book did happen, but not necessarily to me, and, and you know, and, and it's, I do exaggerate a little, I mean, you know, there are some half-decent people in the city. They're not all completely greedy, ruthless, nasty Torres. Is it fair to say that after working for 12 years in the city and earning up to half a million a year, you took advantage of the economic crisis and the fact that your job became less glamorous, less profitable, to turn yourself into an anti-trader and earning another £120,000 by publishing this book? I had a motorbike crash in August 2007. Mm. Almost lost my knee and almost died. And... and the fact of the matter is, is that that was when I had my epiphany. I went into the city for five years. I'd been there 12 years. I suddenly realised, what the hell am I doing? If I had died then, I'd have, yeah. on my deathbed, I'd have thought, you've wasted your life. I gave up a job that was paying me over half a million pounds a year, would have continued to pay me maybe two-thirds mm. that to earn maybe 120 grand over two years. So it was still a big drop. It was not a financially motivated thing. My brother Hugh, who got me my first job, left after a year and then became a, a vicar. Both of us have shown that we weren't really made for being city boys. You compare a trader to a robber. Wouldn't a robber start by giving back the money he stole? I, I am actually uh, putting something back, and I am, um, I'm basically building a school in, in Africa, in Kenya. Um, and that's the start of something I hope to do more of. Um, some people have said, why don't you hand money back to the shareholders? Well, I don't think they deserve it, and I don't want to hand it back to my bank. I don't want to hand it to the shareholders. I will give some of my money, my, my ill-gotten gains, to, uh, to charitable causes that I believe in, i.e. education, particularly in the third world. In your book, Steve spends £800 in one evening with a client. Does that really happen? I used to buy my votes. I mean, there's a bill going through Parliament, well, it's gone through Parliament, called, called the Bribery Act. And it's is going to be against lavish corporate entertainment and i i took clients i was with clients in vegas in miami i was um taking them out for thousand pound nights paid by the bank yeah yeah not by me no 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 I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> you know my modus operandi was really simple it was to make the client think he's your friend mm. because a client who thinks he's your friend is going to be much more likely to give you commission and vote for you in the yeah. all-important surveys which are very important for analysts no matter what everyone else says and quite simply, that worked for me. You know, a couple of bottles of wine at lunch is unlikely to secure you Fidelity's business these days. It's a bit more, you need to be a bit more complex, a yeah. bit more educated, a bit more... Uh, it's so competitive and it's so hard. Yeah. Reading your book, I sense that traders are paid huge amounts of money for not doing much. Back then, my Back then. particular role mm. in my team was not based on my ability with spreadsheets. Yeah. It was not based on my understanding of valuation, of cash flow, of um, accountancy. Mm. Those are the things that theoretically analysts really need to know. Yeah. My role in the team was quite different. Yeah. My skills really were very simple. I could drink and party very well and get by on very little sleep and I could bullshit extremely well. That means effectively thinking on your feet but also when I went into presentations and they were starting talking about you know the cash flow from some minor subdivision of a company I didn't really know that well I had an ability to not feel awkward, an ability to somehow change the subject like a politician does or say that's not really what's important, you need to be thinking about this, this is the really big issue. Yeah. And I started in 96 and I ended up leading one of the highest ranked teams in the entire city, which yeah. was really surprising, it's more surprising to me <laughs> than anyone else. You are about to write another book, can you tell us a bit more about that? The book is about a guy who's writing an anonymous column for the London paper, he's doing a bit too much cocaine, he's getting paranoid, he thinks his boss is going to um, sack him just before bonuses, as occurs in the city. And he breaks into his boss's computer to find it's if it's true. And in that process, he finds out his boss is money laundering for the Colombian drug cartels. And the rest of the book is, is about what he does, how he gets chased around by some hitmen and various other things. But it's obviously based on 
some degree of truth and it's it's a kind of an alternative ending it's saying this is yeah, to yeah. city boy it's about the fact that the line between gangsters and banking i think became blurred and actually uh, you know, gangsters were beco becoming very professional and having board meetings and so forth, and bankers were doing semi-criminal activities. What is your message to students of Cass Business School who are about to become analysts, brokers or traders? I, I mean, I definitely think in terms of analysts, make sure you have extreme recommendations. Uh, there's a famous phrase, people in the middle of the road tend to get run over. Don't have hold recommendations. Either really believe in a stock or, or don't. Mm. Buys and sells, no holds. I would not underestimate the importance of client entertainment still, but maybe low-key, make them your friend. It is important. A client who's a friend is a much better uh, bet, frankly. Um, hang on to great analyst coattails, and don't just be a slave to the numbers. Really meet the management. Get to know them. Think, are these people competent? Yeah. You know, because, frankly, the numbers you can make the numbers tell you anything. Frankly, um, I was seduced by the whole money thing and the greed and the, the competitiveness. Yeah. And I think, you know, if you actually analyse City Boys, what feature them that is common amongst them all, more than yeah. anything else, more than greed or materialism or intelligence or yeah. whatever, hard work, it's actually competitiveness. Mm. And what this book was trying to say, what City Boys was trying to say was, when I analyse why people are competitive, including myself, the yeah. principal reason for it is often feelings of insecurity and inadequacy. People who are really calm in themselves don't tend to need to say, look, I've got a Ferrari, everyone. Look, yeah, yeah. I earn more than you. They're yeah. more relaxed. So analyse one's motivation. And I think perhaps if you are hyper-competitive, which the city attracts, maybe think about what the insecurity is that leads to that and maybe yeah, think yeah, about yeah. sorting that out and then, and then <laughs> deciding whether you want to become a city boy. <laughs> Garrett Anderson, thank you very much. Next time we'll speak with Professor Steve Haberman, Deputy Dean at Cass Business School, about the insurance world.